bleibst an seiner Zeit. In ancient times once gave the law, in cloud and majesty and This is the fourth Sunday of Advent, the time of preparing for the coming of Christ our Savior. Today our words are, let it be. We remember that we are to wait, prepare, and witness. Now, as Christ's arrival nears, we are reminded of Mary's words, let it be. It is not up to us to dictate to God how Christ will come into our world and lives, for God continually surprises us. Let God's will be done in each of us. From Isaiah, the seventh chapter, verses 10 through 16. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as the grave or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I won't ask. I won't test the Lord. Then Isaiah said, listen, house of David. Isn't it enough for you to be tiresome for people that you also are tiresome before my God? Therefore, the Lord will give you a sign. The young woman is pregnant and is about to give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. He will eat butter and honey and learn to reject evil and choose good. Before the boy learns to reject evil and choose good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. Okay. <laughs> we relight our candles, which remind us to wait, to prepare, to witness. Now we complete our circle, lighting the candle which proclaims, let it be. Christ is the light of our world, and we have only to open ourselves, and he will come to us. Let us pray. Gracious God, our time of waiting is almost over. We pray that we have prepared well, that we have proclaimed and witnessed to Christ's coming, and that we are now willing to let Christ enter our hearts and lives. Amen. I suppose that sometimes we all need to be reminded that we have no control over the light. <sighs> Listen now to this reading from Matthew, the first chapter starting in the 18th verse. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. 
for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our Advent hymn, hymn 215, to a maid engaged to Joseph, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 6. To a maid engaged to Joseph, the angel Gabriel came. Fear not, the angel told her, I come to bring good news. Good news, I come to tell you. Good news, I say. Angels show up in the dark. At least in the gospel stories and the birth narratives, angels show up in the dark. When people are in the deep of night, whether or not they're sleeping. I mean, just consider for a moment the stories that have to do with angels around the birth narrative, including Zechariah, because he's in the temple, and we have to assume it's dark because he's there to light the candles. Mary. Joseph, the shepherds, all of them have an angel visitation or angels visiting them in the dark of night. And there's something unnerving about the dark of night for even the bravest among us. I, I mean, think about what happens in your home in the evening. Most of us can be in our houses all day long in the bright of day, and the minute the lights go out and we get in bed, there's those noises that you start to notice just a little bit. Those noises were there all day. But now that the lights are off and you're laying quietly, those noises seem to show up louder than ever. And I would imagine that that was true even in the days when there was no electricity that there were things that were mysterious in the dark, things that nobody could explain. There was mystery in the dark. And that's why I believe when the angels show up, every single time they start with the words, do not be afraid or fear not, depending on your translation, because the angels understood that. But let's talk about the angels that show up in the gospel stories just for a moment. You know, we have this idea of these meek and mild angels, you know, willow tree angels, precious moments angels. There are these beautiful little figures. They have pretty faces and flowing hair, and they're dressed in beautiful robes. These are not 
what's described in the scripture. The angels or God's messengers that show up in the scripture are massive figures with booming voices. Some of them are even described as carrying flaming swords with them. This is not what you're buying in the Hallmark store. This is not what's adorning the front of your Christmas cards. These angels came with all the power of God behind them to bring a message to the people who needed to hear the message. And of course, we know sometimes the message was not very welcome. Sometimes the message was not mm, what we might consider good news. And in these cases, while it says it's good news, I'm not sure that it always felt like good news when they were receiving these messages. I mean, consider for a moment Mary and the story in Luke's gospel. We all know the birth narrative in Luke's gospel. I mean, that's the one, if you've ever been to a church on Christmas Eve night, you know that that's the story you're going to hear. But imagine you're Mary. You're 14 years old. You're betrothed to a man named Joseph. And the angel of the Lord shows up to you at night and says to you, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now, first of all, at 14 years old, I don't care whether you're in the first century or you're in the 21st century, having an angel tell you that you have found favor with God has got to be at least a little bit unnerving. And then he says to her, and because you found favor with God, you're going to have a baby. This is the new revised Denise Peckham version, by the way. Um, and so she, has, so she, you know, just says, okay. Okay. Um, fear not. Fear not, Mary, because you're going to have a baby, and it's going to be from the Holy Spirit. I think Mary had a lot to fear, or at least a lot, of, a lot to be anxious about in those days to come, because Think about this for just a brief moment. A betrothal, we think of the betrothal of Mary as an engagement, but this is not an engagement like we have today. This is a legally binding contract that her father probably brokered at some point in her life to a man that she may not have even known at the time, and she's promised to meet him on their wedding night pure. Who is going to believe, who is going to believe that she has been impregnated by the Holy Spirit? I would imagine that there's a little bit of anxiety in Mary's life at this point. Because I think she knows that no matter whether she was fully educated or partially educated, come from a wealthy family or from a poor, impoverished family, there's a problem with this story. I mean, would you believe your 14-year-old? I wouldn't. I mean, that's just the truth. But she knew the scripture, and so did Joseph. See, they were both raised as faithful Hebrew people, boys and girls, young men and young women. They were raised in their faith, and they knew the prophecy, and they knew the story. But they were also real people living in a real time, in a real place, in a real world that was harsh and judgmental, not much unlike the world we live in today. And, and when we think about this, right, them being real people in a real place at a real time, we often don't think about Joseph. We only ever talk about Mary, right, because she had beautiful words. And Joseph, well, he has no words, no words from Joseph. He's silent, but think for a minute about the betrayal that Joseph must have felt. This one was to be his wife. They were going to have a family. They were going to do the things that every other Jew in Nazareth has ever done from time immemorial. They were going to get married. They were going to have a family. Joseph was going to make wooden things. Mary was going to keep the house and raise the children. And all of a sudden, that's gone. And so Joseph, 
being a righteous man, and that's what the text says. He was a righteous man, and I know I did this one time in, a, in another service, but how many of you think you're righteous? Hmm. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. So the word righteous is really just about being right with God. Are you striving to be right with God? That's the question. And righteousness is also translated virtuous or just. So Joseph, amongst other people in the Bible, and your name might be there too, was striving to be right with God, to be virtuous, to do things that was pleasing to God. And so he had a choice. He had a choice to make. He could have gone by the letter of the law, which meant that there would have been a public divorce because a betrothal is a legally binding contract and he could have publicly divorced her and called her out. Or the other option was to do the righteous thing and to think more of her than of himself. And so he chose to dismiss her quietly and quickly with no public fuss. Just let her be with her pregnancy by whoever the father was. And it seems that just as, if, as Joseph is getting ready to turn that corner and make that choice, he has a dream. And the angel of God shows up and says to him, don't do that, Joseph. This is not a good choice because you see this child was in fact conceived by the Holy Spirit and he, the Holy Spirit, is going to um, have this child born because this is to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah that says a young girl will be with child and this will be Emmanuel, God with us. So think again about your choice, Joseph, because God has another plan for your life. And so Joseph gets up in the morning with a perspective that God has placed in his heart and mind, and Joseph doesn't divorce Mary. And thanks be to God, because the whole story would be very different than the one we've just heard, wouldn't it? Joseph, in his righteousness, listened to what the angel told him, understood that this was from God, and did what God asked him to do to change his whole life, to set aside his ego and his own will and the way of the tradition and to take Mary as his wife. Leonard Sweet, the theologian and uh, dean of Drew Divinity School in New Jersey, said that at the moment the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph, the whole miracle of Christmas momentarily rested on Joseph's shoulders, awaiting his freely chosen decision to either accept or reject the stunning news of an impending Messiah. You know, as we think about Joseph and his simple assent to what God asked of him, it's amazing to me that we often overlook Joseph because we want him to have words. We want people to enter into debate, to ask the hard questions, to maybe even have a little bit of crass pushback, but not Joseph. He just silently does what God has asked him to do, unlike so many of us. A few months later, we know that there's this registration in Bethlehem. I'm saving that story for Saturday. Uh, but this would be the birth of the child. And David Lose, the New Testament professor and author that I've quoted before in this particular season, says this about what's coming up in the months that will be between jo uh, Joseph's silent yes, and the birth of the child. He says, I think it's safe to say that the months leading up to Christ's birth were not one blissful baby shower after another. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? But they were fraught with anxiety, concern, and flights of emotion. Now, I have to say that that makes Joseph and Mary pretty normal, just like anybody else. 
anxiety, concern, and flights of emotion. You don't have to be having a baby. You don't have to be having the Messiah to have concern and worry and flights of emotion. Real people, real time, real place. They were just normal, average, everyday people doing what normal, average, everyday people do trying to do the things that were pleasing to God throughout their lives. And whether or not the yes was, let it be with me according to your word, or the silent ascent of this one man who knew God in the very fiber of his being, they just did life with God and with one another in their community. Oddly enough, Joseph is visited by the angel three more times in the gospel of Matthew. He is visited about two years later, we think, when Herod finds out that there was a king born in Bethlehem, and he is going to make sure that that king does not survive. And so the angel of the Lord comes to Joseph and says, take Mary and the child. It's time for you to flee and go to Egypt as quickly as possible because Herod is going to destroy every child two years old and younger. And so he does that. Again, no conversation, no fanfare, not a single word. Sometime after that, the angel appears to him again at night and says to him, okay, now take your family and go back to Israel. It's time for you to go to the promised land where you're supposed to be. And again, Joseph packs up his family, goes to Israel. On the way home, another visit by the angel of the Lord who says to him, you can't go back to Jerusalem because Herod's son is still looking for you, so please stop in Nazareth, and that's where you're going to make your home. I don't know how many of you have ever seen a Christmas pageant or been in a Christmas pageant or had a child or grandchild in a Christmas pageant, but if you or a loved one were ever Joseph, was there ever a speaking part? Not at all. And here he was. He gets up and does what any, not any, He does what most fathers would do. He does the best he can and continues to walk in the way and the will of God. He takes care of his wife. He takes care of his child and whatever children come after that. Joseph is a father. Joseph is a husband and he does the best he can. And he does it faithfully. He doesn't compromise. He does what God is asking him to do. And he packs up and does it over and over and over again. Should we all take some lessons from this man? Joseph is both the silent and willing participant in God's grand plan of salvation. And somehow, I just don't see Joseph one day at the wood table lathing a piece of wood and saying, oh, I I really hope that God chooses me to be the father of the savior of the world. I don't think this was ever Joseph's plan. And I'm sure that there were mornings where Joseph got up in the light of day and stood at the door of his home, no matter where that was, and thought, do you really have the right person, God? I mean, I I don't think I'm equipped to take care of the Savior of the world. But yet he did, because that was the call. I struggle with this one, this one silent disciple, this one character in the Christmas story. Because I think ultimately he is what a disciple should be. The one who no matter what is asked of him by the God who knows him and loves him, just says yes over and over. Every day it's another yes to God. And I think it might do all of us well if we perhaps took a little time this week and read maybe even more than once the first two chapters of Matthew's gospel, because that's the only place you'll find Joseph in Matthew's gospel. He disappears silently after the second chapter, and we have to assume that he's still doing whatever it is that God asked him to do right up until the moment that His life ended on this side of glory. But then it might be worth asking, as we read that story, are we willing 
to set our egos aside and do what God is asking us to do? Are we willing to set our egos aside and be the people God is asking us to be? I think those are questions that are worth asking as we come up to the manger. Because perhaps if we ask those questions with humble hearts open to hearing a word from God, we might actually hear in the dark of the night that voice calling to us with words of assurance and hope. We might get what my friend Sandy would call a midnight visit. And in the midnight visit, we might really find what God is asking of us and who we were always created to be.
come now to our time of prayer and concern for others in our service of worship. And I know that you know of those persons that you want to lift up and <clears throat> be in prayer about in a special kind of way. I would encourage you to do that. Then I've, I've been trying to figure out exactly how to say this. Uh, I want to say thank you. Juan Il and I want to say thank you for all of your prayers and concerns uh, for me over the last several days. Uh, things happen in a hurry, so uh, and I guess that's good. Uh, but uh, I am grateful to all of those who were a part of uh, making everything work. Uh, and yes, I'm doing well. Uh, I have another one to go through on January the 11th. But if the doctor knows what he's talking about, and I believe that he does, uh, it'll be a simple one as well. So uh, uh, I just simply want to say thank you for all the phone calls, all of the prayers, all of the uh, invest in, investing of your time and your spirit uh, in my health. It is... Uh, it is gratefully appreciated, and uh, uh, you just don't know how much we appreciate having you as our church family. It is important to us. So in a very simple way, let me say to you, thank you. We want to acknowledge all of the beautiful poinsettias, and I'm guessing the list is coming out. Uh-uh. We're not pu publishing a list this year. Okay. The luminary list. Okay, I, I didn't. I hadn't been involved in those decisions, so I didn't know, uh, and I forgot to ask before I got up here. But uh, we simply want to acknowledge the beautiful poinsettias. They just always seem to add so much to our uh, Christmas season and our services of worship. Would you join me now as we share together the intercessory prayer as is printed in your bulletin? As we pray, eternal God, in the long ago days when the earth was flat and heaven was above the clouds and disease was caused by demons, your son was born to lighten all our darknesses. We now, after the enlightenment, enlightenment are in bondage to different limitations. We doubt what we cannot prove. We ignore what we cannot see. And to find and find little room for faith. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee. We admit ourselves to be both infected and affected by the spirit of our times. Behind talk of world peace, we hear the machinery of war. Beneath talk of global equality, we detect the posturing of the powerful. Behind talk of your church being renewed, we recognize the bondage of failed patterns of the past. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Ah, God, who will save us? Our cynicism is the fruit of our experience, not the key to the future. Our suspiciousness helps us to smell the rat, never to recognize the dove. Our perfect analysis may describe the mountain, but is helpless to move it. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. 
as Christmas approaches, give us a share of that divine naivete enjoyed by Elizabeth and Zachariah, by Mary and Joseph, and unnamed country folk who encountered angels and believed the good news and recognized Christ among them. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, we boldly pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the, and the power, power and, and the, the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. And we sing our carol, Carol 216, Lo, how a rose air blooming. to that time in our worship service where we remember that our worship includes our giving, the giving of our tithes and offerings. Um, we come to the end of the year. Really, it's hard to imagine that 2022 is just about over. Uh, but I hope that as we come to the end of the year, you will consider your offering and how we might finish as strong as we began this year. I thank you for all of the commitment that you have made to this church and to the offering week after week. We have um, just a few opportunities for ministry right now, which are all in worship. 
Saturday. We are having three services. I hope that you have seen that advertised in all of the different places it is, but 11 o'clock is at Mosaic. It's a family-friendly service, um, and it will be about 40 minutes, and will include cake and juice boxes, included, and the Christmas story, of course. But if you're uh, wanting to come and do something a little different on Christmas Eve, that would be the service, and it's at the Mosaic campus. There are two services here at 7 o'clock and 9 o'clock. There's candle lighting in all three services, except that at 11 o'clock it is with glow sticks because we anticipate many young children who don't need to be holding lit candles at the end of worship on that afternoon. Uh, then on Christmas Day, we are having a service here in the sanctuary at 1030. And on New Year's Day, we will have one service at the Mosaic campus at 1030 as well. So if you have any questions about that, please call the church office. We would love to visit with you about that. But uh, we are going to try and honor the Sundays. And I know that if you have friends who will say to you, we are not worshiping on Sunday because we will have worshiped Saturday. Um, that was an intentional decision on our part to worship on Sunday. And so whether you are home, that the Sunday service will be live streamed, or whether you can be here in person, it, those will not be uh, necessarily as formal as a Sunday service normally is, but we um, recognize that Christmas Day is the day that we will celebrate the birth of our Savior. And so I hope that you will be here for that and that you will come the following Sunday to kick off your new year with worship. Uh, thank you for your continued commitment to this church to worship, to pray, to serve in all the many ways that you do. Let us stand together and affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed, the traditional ver version. Let us say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Closing hymn, hymn 206, I want to walk as a child of the light. Shiny. 
benediction just a word joed just told me to let everyone know that yes there will be worship on monday morning in the chapel so if you are inclined to come to that please do so he will be there receive now this benediction sometimes the most important thing we can do is to just say yes to god without fanfare without discussion, without our egos getting in the way. And sometimes that yes leads to things we can't imagine as we go about our day-to-day lives. So, So it might just be time this week to consider that we are righteous people, working to be right with God and with one another, And that God does, in fact, have work for us to do. And it might not be work that gets our names in lights, but it could be the most important work of all. Go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.